One of the things that I like to emphasize in CSU, Luis, is our active participation in the liturgy and the fact that we need to consciously engage in what's going on. And I normally do the last Mass of the week in the extraordinary form because this is the form of Mass that actually requires you to pay far more attention than the ordinary form. Because you think you understand what's going on in the ordinary form, but that lulls you into a false sense of security. Whereas you have to be engaged, you have to listen, you have to watch in the extraordinary form to better follow what's going on and to actively engage yourself. To end this week, please open your Bibles. I know I talked to a number of you before Mass. Open your Bibles to St. John's Gospel, chapter 6. Some of you already had it open, you were praying, so that's good. For those of you with the flowery cover, what page was it? Okay, well, someone had it. Vanessa, I showed you what no, I don't think someone else. What what page is it? I can't hear you. In the New Testament. Got it? Alright, very good. What I'm going to do today is I want to talk about chapter 6 of John's Gospel, which is the Eucharistic chapter in his Gospel. I want you to recall briefly, especially for those of you who have not been in CSU, that one of the themes that we keep going back to is that Jesus is the Word of God and that the Word became flesh. That's the, the, the motto of the Catholic Central University, that, the word, that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was made flesh which is from St. John's Gospel. I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly, so I need you to pay attention to the verse numbers. If you didn't look at it before, that's okay. I will pause for just a second for you to at least skim the verse so you have an idea of what I'm talking about. So, the first thing we see is that in verse 2, the large crowd is following him because of the signs that he was doing for the sick. And St. John Chrysostom mentions the fact that even though they're favored with such great teaching by our Lord, they're not as influenced by the teaching than by the miracles, which shows that their belief is in a lower state. But after this, what does he do? Verse 3, he goes up on the mountain, right? He does this a lot in the Gospels, because the mountains are a privileged place of encounter with God. That's why the sanctuary is elevated. As a symbol of that. And he sits down there with his disciples. Sitting was a customary posture of teaching. Verse 4. The Passover was near. The Passover is the, the feast that we've been speaking about all week. Especially in Exodus chapter 12. With the sacrifice of the lamb. And then he asks Philip. Look at verse 5. Where are we going to buy bread for these people to eat? He asks the question, obviously, not because he needs to know the answer. He knows what he's going to do. He asks the question to show the disciples that they don't yet believe like they should and that they don't have the answers. As it says in verse 6 there, he, he sang this to put him to the test. In verse 9, he said, uh, Andrew says, there's a boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? This task of feeding the crowd seems very daunting to them. And I would add to our to his missionaries, you probably feel like you're trying to feed 5,000 with just the five loaves and the two fish. And yet our Lord will take care of that. Leo. <coughs> Look then at verse 11. He takes the loaves, and we give him thanks, he distributes those who are seated. One of the translations uh, says that he gives it to his disciples, who then distribute it to the crowds. And that's found in other Gospels as well. That's very interesting, because that's exactly what's going on in the Eucharist, right? Our Lord offers himself in sacrifice, and then he puts them in the hand, himself in the hands of his priests, who work, who work with the successors of the apostles, the bishops, to distribute the Eucharist to the people. Note what he says there. And when he had given thanks, the Greek word for that phrase is eucharist, 
extensas. Diadome. So, eucharistensas. What is that? That's the word for Eucharist. That's Thanksgiving, right? St. John Chrysostom notes here, he didn't really want any material to work from, but only because he uses created things for the purpose to show that creation is served by his wisdom. In other words, this is why we have sacraments, the fact that there are, God uses matter to save us. In verse 12, what do they say? Gather the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. This is why, this is one of those uh, things that teaches us great respect for the Eucharist, and to make sure that whatever we do in Mass of the Holy Eucharist, that we're always very careful to make sure that none of the particles are desecrated accidentally or on purpose. How many baskets are there in verse 13? Look at it. Right, for the number of apostles, right? So that each of the apostles then are, is, is going to receive at his ordination at the Last Supper, Power to perpetuate the sacrifice in time. <clears throat> and again, those priests who are united with them. Look at verse 15. He feeds the crowd, and then they want to make him king. And so St. John Christopher points out, see what the belly can do. We see this in our society with people who are going to elect officials that promise to give them free things. But of course, they're not free. They come from us, right? taxpayers. <clears throat> and at the end of this, he withdraws again to the mountain by himself. So, keep going. You're familiar with the story of Jesus walking on the water, which begins in verse 16, right? He gets in the boat, they cross, the sea becomes rough, and St. Augustine comments that on his ascension aloft, his ascension to heaven that is, a storm came upon the disciples in the ship, that is the church, in fact, that's why we call the part of the church we're sitting in the nave, it's the boat. As the end of the world draws nigh, error increases, iniquity abounds. So, between the time of the ascension and the second coming, the church is going to be tossed in a storm. But then our Lord is walking on the waters, we see in verse 19 and verse 20, he says to them, It is I, do not be afraid. That's not a good translation. What he says is, I am. Do not be afraid. For those of you who remember this, I am is the name that God gives Moses from the burning bush. In other words, I'm God, I've got this under control, y'all just relax. Again, toast to his missionaries. Okay? Verse 21 there. If we're willing to also receive Christ into the ship, to live in our hearts, we shall also find ourselves immediately in the place where we wish to be, that is, in heaven. And starting with verse 22, then our Lord is going to start speaking about more clearly the Eucharist, right? So, in verse 23, they start looking for Jesus. And where is Jesus? We're told at the end of the chapter that this is taking place, this, this conversation is taking place in the synagogue at Capernaum. And as one of the commentators notes, the synagogue is a symbol for the Jewish people. So this is his engaging with the Jewish people. Verse 25, what are they asking? Rabbi, when did you come here? Uh, Chrysostom again, St. John Chrysostom again points out the lightness of their mind. Like, one day they're trying to make him king, and the next day they've forgotten about that completely. And again, this is pointing out the fact that they're, what they're really interested in is filling their bellies. Verse 26, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the fill of the loaves. So he's saying this. St. Augustine puts it this way, as, as if he said, you seek me to satisfy the flesh, not the spirit. That's going to come in, that's going to be important in a couple of verses. In a couple of lines, the Jews are also going to refer to the manna in the desert, which God provided because they complained because of their lack of food in the desert during the Exodus. And still worse, the Israelites wanted to go back to Egypt to slavery just to satisfy their stomachs. Hopefully everyone feels very guilty at lunch today. Verse 27. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. 
A lot of what our Lord is going to say here is similar to what he says in chapter 4 of the same gospel when he's speaking with the Samaritan woman in the well. St. Augustine says, under the figure of food, he alludes to himself. You seek me, he says, for the sake of something else. Seek me for my own sake. And many Christians fall into this trap as well. We only come to God when we want something for ourselves instead of wanting him for himself. That's not love. In verse 29, this is the work of God that you believe in him and he sent. We want to make a distinction here in believing facts and believing in a person. There's a difference between believing that Jared exists and actually being able to trust Jared. I hope we can trust Jared, but the fact is that there's a difference between believing in the existence of someone and actually believing themselves. St. Augustine comments on this in his belief is that many of these disciples believe in the same way that the demons do. The demons believe that Jesus is God and that he exists, but they don't believe in him as God. And when they don't listen, they don't trust him. And so here in verse 31 is where the Jews bring up the point of man, right? Our ancestors ate man in the wilderness, okay? And nothing, as the, uh, St. John Chrysostom says, can be more unreasonable for them than asking for another sign. They just got fed by five loaves and two fish the day before. He just fed an entire crowd with just that amount of food, and they're wanting, show us something else. It's like a circus or binging a show on Netflix. It's just about entertaining. It's not about actual belief. But it's the same thing that happened with Moses and the Israelites. They saw the miracles, they saw the plagues, they saw the man, and they saw all these things, and yet they still wanted to return to Egypt for the food, which is, as St. John Christopher Christopher points out, is the force of appetite. So verse 32, very, amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it's my father. And this Gospel of St. John has a lot of comparisons between our Lord and Moses. And we see that at the very beginning of the Gospel. The prologue to John's Gospel is not just important because it gives us two lines from the CSU model. The prologue of John's Gospel is a summary introduction of the entire Gospel with all of the themes in it. And it's very important to know that Gospel. So the last two verses of the prologue um, St. John tells us, through Moses, the law was given to us, through Jesus Christ, grace came to us in truth. Going down to verse 35, again our Lord is saying, as the woman of Samaria, when our Lord told her, whoever drinks of this water, they shall never thirst. In the same way, these are saying, give us this bread which refreshes the courts. And fails us not. So in other words, he promises bread and they get excited because they want that. But in verse 36, what does he say? But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. St. Augustine says, you desire bread from heaven, but though you have it before you, you eat it not. He's not speaking about necessarily eating. He's speaking about he is the bread of heaven, but they don't really want him. What they really want is to fill their bellies. Go to verse 40, that all who see the Son and believe in Him may have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Again, this is a continuing theme of St. John's Gospel. The Word becomes flesh and dwells among us, and in verse 18, St. John says in his prologue, chapter 1, No man has ever seen God, but now He's only begotten the Son who abides in the bosom of the Father, has Himself become our interpreter. Verse 41, here are the Jews complaining again. They complain because he says, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. And St. John Christus again, he's got no mercy for this crowd. What he says is that the real cause of their complaint is that they were disappointed in their expectation of a bodily feast. And so what do they do now? Because they can't believe him. What do they say in verse 42? Isn't this Jesus the son of Joseph? 
We know where he's from. Why does he think he's special? But again, St. John's already provided the origins of Jesus in the uh, prologue of his gospel. In principio era verbum, et verbum caro factum est. Verse 44. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father. And this is the doctrine of grace. No matter what decision we make, we are always called by God first. And this is very interesting. Look at verse 49, as our Lord is responding to the Jews. St. Augustine comments on this line, says, And because they had taunted him with the manna, he adds, Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, and they are dead. Your fathers they are, for you are like them, murmuring sons of murmuring fathers. Because nothing, the, the Jews, the Israelites in the desert in the Exodus, their greatest defense against God was the fact that they complained constantly instead of being grateful. Look at verse 41. So he's promising, or he's, he's not just promising, he's telling them that they need to um, eat. His, so whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread that I will give to my life, of the life of the world, is my flesh. One of the commentators says, makes the point very clearly, why do we not see the flesh in the Holy Eucharist? It's because if the flesh were seen, it would be disgusting and we would be unable to participate in it. And so therefore, because of our weakness, the food that is given to us, that is the flesh of Jesus, given to us under an appearance that we can tolerate. And of course, they have a problem with this because they think that he's going to start cutting himself up and distributing himself for food, which of course would have been impossible and ridiculous if he did it that way. I mean, I guess he could do it that way because he's God. But the point is, is that they assumed, I should say, that's what he would, his intention was. And so, in verse 53 there, he emphasizes the point even further. Amen, amen, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. And St. John Chrysostom points out, as they thought it was impossible that he should do as he said, he shows them that it was not only possible, but necessary. Just like in chapter 3 of this gospel, he emphasizes the necessity of baptism. And St. John Chrysostom again says, so this is no enigma, it's no parable. You really do have to eat the body of Christ. Look at verse 56. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. It's very interesting. Again, this is a theme of St. John's Gospel. You're going to see this a lot at the Last Supper and in his discourses. But Moses is told by God in chapter 16 of Exodus, where the manna appears, that a quantity of it is meant to be kept in a jar and placed in the tabernacle before the Lord. And it was actually in the Ark of the Covenant. In other words, the Eucharist is God's abiding presence among us. Not just when he comes into us sacramentally, which is of course the most important, but also when he is here present among us in the tabernacle. Verse 58. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Of course, he's talking about himself and his body again. <clears throat> Hilary of Poitiers says, of the truth, then, of the body and blood of Christ, and this is written in the year three, this is written in the fourth century, in the three hundreds. No room for doubting remains, for by the declaration of our Lord Himself and by the teaching of our own faith, the flesh is really flesh and the blood really blood. This then is our principle of life. While we are in the flesh, Christ dwells in us by His flesh. We see in verse fifty-nine there again that He said these things in the synagogue in Capernaum. I have a number of other comments, but I want to leave, just uh, end on this one. If you look at verse 60, it says, this teaching is difficult, who can accept it? And then, go to verse 66. The, again, the Bible, the, the, the chapter and verse divisions of the Bible are arbitrary, they're not 
done on purpose, but it's very interesting that chapters, verse 66 of chapter 6 of this gospel is, because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went with him. They left Jesus because of the Eucharist. And notice what he does. He doesn't say, wait, 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 sorry, you guys, you're obviously very confused. You think I really mean you have to eat my body. I don't mean that. What I mean is, no. he didn't say that, does he? What does he say? Look at verse 67. He turns to the apostles and says, are you going to go away as well? There's no begging. There's no changing his mind. There's no clarifying. He means exactly what he is saying. And that is a consolation to us. He gives us his body and blood. We treat that body and blood with respect. We adore that body and blood present on the altar in the tabernacle. We spend time with him and we give him as much as love as we can because he has given himself to us, not only on the cross, but also here in the Holy Eucharist. And as St. Augustine says in his commentary on this passage, in praise of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, O sacrament of mercy, O sign of unity, O bond of love. Whoever wishes to live, let him draw near, believe, be incorporated, that he may be given life.